Hello everyone and welcome to my channel where today we are back with more Dark Souls 3 lore reactions from Varty Vidya where we're getting into the next videos in his Dark Souls 3 lore series uh, which is doing the Hollows of Londor and the Angels of Lothric. So very curious to see what these videos are going to be about, uh, what they're going to detail. Let's just jump right into it, shall we? Londor. They call it the Hollow Realm, and it has links to a primordial serpent, to New Londo, to Velka, the goddess of sin, and to the most intriguing, hard-to-get ending of Dark Souls 3. It's a hugely significant location from a lore point of view, and I'm confident that this is where the DLC will be based. Wrong! <laughs> It's so interesting to go through, obviously, these videos that are being done before the DLC comes out. So this is why we're reacting to videos that are a bit more in, like, chronological posting order. Um, in, like, video release order, I should say. Uh, because otherwise, if I jump around too much, his own internal, like, laws and theories will shift and change as new things come out. So going through it in order of what's been posted is, I think, much better. But, yeah, it's like, we're going to get theories about how... Londor is going to be the base of the DLC, which is not a bad uh, a bad assumption or theory at all, considering the fact that there is like the quite a huge Londor focus as like a side quest leading up to an actual ending. So that would actually be an interesting thing that I'd I'd love to also uh, check out and see explored one day. Except I don't know if Dark Souls will ever be revisited as a as a series. So. We'll just have to see what this video enlightens us with in terms of Londorian lore. Let me paint a picture of Londor for you. Londor is a society of undead, comprised of corpses and shades who have led unsavory lives. As such, these hollows are deeply detested and hated, which is nothing new for hollow kind, really. It's even been recorded that sometimes a hollow will use a purging stone to remove the physical effects of the undead curse, temporarily reversing their hollowing, and occasionally a hollow will even fool himself into thinking he's no longer cursed and will turn on his own kind. Which reminds me of what Hodrick says down here. This pit is for hollows, not for the likes of you sane folk. Or perhaps you are a hollow, posing as otherwise? And I tell you these things because even though the Hollows of Londor are hated, even though they sometimes fight amongst themselves, they still remain a truly unique example of Hollows forming a society. And that is interesting because I don't know who this person is. Uh, Hodrick looks to be in the boss arena of the Cursed Rotten Greatwood. Uh, I have not encountered this character in my playthrough before, so we're going to have to look and look up and see who the hell this person is as well. But it looks like they have ties to, to Londor. That's a shame, but that's okay. We'll figure this out um, at a later date. As undead are a powerful force if they have a purpose. We see that in the Undead Legion who fought the Abyss, and we see that in every protagonist from a Dark Souls game, really. So it begs the question. What are the Undying Hollows of Londor fighting for, and what are they bound by? The Age of Fire was founded by the old gods, sustained by the linking of the fire. But the gods are no more, and the all-powerful fire deserveth a new heir. Our Lord of Hollows, it shall be who weareth the true face of mankind. This is Yuria. Seeker of the Lord of Hollows, and one of the three maidens who founded the Sable Church of Londor. The Sable Church translates to the Black Church, and its towers are said to resemble the eight jagged branches of the Morian Blade. The Church is said to offer salvation to Hollows, which must be a pretty attractive tagline for cursed individuals. I'd wager that if I was cursed with undeath, then I'd be pretty open to a little bit of faith to keep me from hollowing. So it's True. very clearly implied that the Sable Church is what keeps <clears throat> the hollows of Londor grounded. 
This faith is not an oath taken lightly, however, because those who fuck up are exiled and they're given the words to the atonement miracle. Hollows who recite this miracle think that they're reciting words of forgiveness, but in reality, the atonement miracle makes you attract more attention from foes and increases enemy aggro range. That's a pretty evil punishment. Not wow. only are you exiled, you're exiled and you have death following you everywhere. Mm. The three maidens who founded the Sable Church, they cut an imposing figure. All three are highly skilled fencers, so skilled, in fact, that they were able to found the Sable Church between just the three of them. Missed the backstab. The third eldest daughter is named Lillian, a woman who seems to have contributed a lot of the theology behind the church. Got the backstab. She was the first to speak the words of the Londor Braille Divine Tome, and is also said to recount tales that portray the suffering and conflict of Hollows. Lillian is not featured in game, not yet, anyway. The second eldest. How did you find out about Lillian? And if Lillian was the speaker, then Yuria would be the swordswoman, as she is said to have claimed a hundred lives with her weapon, Darkdrift. This legendary cursed sword with an unseen blade that penetrates straight through shields. He, uh, Vati in. The first in the Lore of the Bosses video that we watched included Sources, which is um, we're seeing right here, like Source Dark Drift. I wonder if maybe these closed captions are um, going over it. They are. Um, that's a shame that the Source is left down here and it's being covered by uh, the the subtitles there's no source being listed for Lillian or unless it's the Londor Braille divine tome that's actually really interesting because I obviously we've read the Londor Braille divine tome oh it does mention it wow I've just totally forgotten that. A braille tome of Londor, first spoken by Lillian of the Sable Church. Give this to a storyteller to learn miracles of Londor. That's cool. So this is where Lillian does get mentioned. I was just like, for a second, I was just going, where the hell is Vati pulling Lillian from? <laughs> She's not featured in game. But there you go. Sorry, this is just me, obviously, not being able to see the source of where this law comes from. I'm keeping the closed captions on and it's why my webcam's up here. So it can be, it can be read. Uh, it's both for me and for you. Um, so I'll just have to assume that a source is being provided for all of these little pieces and tidbits. ...that portray the suffering and conflict of Hollows. Lillian is not featured in game, not yet anyway. The second eldest is Yuria. And if Lillian was the speaker, then Yuria would be the swordswoman, as she is said to have claimed a hundred lives with her weapon, Darkdrift. This legendary cursed sword with an unseen blade that penetrates straight through shields. Nothing can defend from Darkdrift. And the eldest, the firstborn daughter? She's not been named, but we know that she exists because these three daughters founded the church, and the only others in this equation that go without names, well, they're the mother and the father of the three daughters. And surely these parents are important, right? Because why else would there be three founders that are referenced as daughters with mentions to their order of birth? So the only reason I can think of that they would do this is that the parents are important. And I think I know who the mother might be, but that speculation will wait till the end of the video. At any rate, <laughs> these three daughters are described as maidens of a primordial serpent, and when we murder Yuria, we figure out who this serpent is. Ooh, okay. Oh. I have failed thee. Wow. Greetings, undead warrior. I am the primordial serpent, Darkstalker Karth. That's cool. I can guide thee. And illuminate the truth. Your ancestor claimed the dark soul and waited for fire to subside. And soon 
the flames did fade, and only dark remained. Thus began the Age of Men, the Age of Dark. However, Lord Gwyn trembled at the dark, clinging to his Age of Fire, and in dire fear of humans, and the Dark Lord who would one day be born amongst them. Lord Gwyn resisted the course of nature by sacrificing himself to link the fire and commanding his children to shepherd the humans. Gwyn has blurred your past to prevent the birth of the Dark Lord. I am the primordial serpent. I seek to right the wrongs of the past, to discover our true Lord. Primordial Serpent of Dark Souls 1, who corrupted the Four Kings, who polluted the Kingdom of Ulusil with the Abyss, is back. And now, through Yuria, through the Sable Church of Londor, the Pilgrims, Yol, Karth continues to seek a ruler of men. They failed me, every last one of them. They were strong, but saw not the truth. I am certain that you will prove different. Karth and the Sable Church are watching events in Lothric very closely, because the world is on the precipice of the linking of the fire, and the Sable Church are determined to influence that event. Hundreds of Londor pilgrims are sent towards the highest towers of Lothric Castle. So many of them have died on the way here, and they're presumably coming here because the Lothric bloodline is obsessed with creating a worthy heir to link the fire, and that's the event that Londor want to influence. However, they're kind of out of luck, because Lothric refused to link the fire, and you, the unkindled who the linking of the fire passed down to, by some twist of fate, met with Yol, a pilgrim who had all but given up. Ah, you have attained ample strength. All will soon be clear, my good lord. Thanks to thee, your soul is redeemed. Allow me to express my gratitude in his stead. Remember when I thought that Yuria murdered Yol? <laughs> She's keeping an eye on all of those who could potentially be a Lord of Hollows. But it was my fault. Anri, another. But she believes that you are the true Lord of Hollows, and compels you to strike down Orbeck before he becomes a threat, and to claim Anri's dark sigils in this ritual within the Dark Moon too. Oh! If were we in the... Did she ask us to kill Orbeck? Maybe I've forgotten that, but like... Obviously we didn't do that in our playthrough, but that's really, that's really interesting if so. The linking of all of this to Karth back to Dark Souls 1 is really cool. It makes me wonder if... Um, the serpents were supposed to or going to make an appearance at one point because there are the statues in the ringed city that have the primordial serpent like heads i remember those so it's it's very cool that they're still like keeping them in but like getting a name drop like mentioned by name is uh is very interesting it's always good to see the parts of the story that i haven't explored a lot of this story with uh, Yuria and like the Londor storyline is not new to me because I actually got that ending. Uh, but the details of like attacking Yuria and like and stuff like that and her dialogue surrounding that is is really cool because obviously I don't know about about that. Trey Yuria, you don't do her quest in time or you straight up attack her, then the pale shade of Londor will hunt you down. But if you're allied with Yuria, then the Pale Shade will assist you throughout the world. Another thing to note is that many characters associated with Londor use bleed weapons like Dark Drift or the Morian Blade or the Mannequin Claws, and Blood Loss is also a proven way to slow the reanimation of the Undying. So that'd be a pretty popular weapon in a land full of hollows. It's imagine if uh, imagine if Pontiff was that easy to fight. So let's talk about the Undying. About the undead curse, the dark sigils, and the dark sign. I've noticed a trend. When characters talk about the dark sign, they often call it a shackle, something weighing men down. With dark unshackled, a curse will be upon us. 
and cast off the shackles placed upon your brethren. One who might shatter the shackles of fate. Shackle my fools who stay young for love, unaware of his grand illusion. The undead curse is often referenced as appearing after Gwyn linked the fire. That's really cool. I like how he's obviously had to go through a bunch of dialogue about uh, the dark sign. And I just love that uh, he's pulled from Dark Souls 2 as well. Because a lot of people just look at Dark Souls 2 as the, as the black sheep. The ugly duckling. Get it out of here. Get this game out of my sight. It's not even good. People write off that game. But what I do like about what Dark Souls 3 does is it does take elements of both Dark Souls 1 and 2 and put that into the game. And uh, another thing is we've got people very happy in Elden Ring right now is because they have apparently brought back the, the power stance from Dark Souls 2. So bit of a bit of a side note. But I do like that uh, Dark Souls 2 does weed its way into the lore and the world of, of Dark Souls 3 whenever it shows up. I appreciate it for that, you know? So we assume that Gwyn is at fault somehow. It's the gods who shackled us, and while we don't quite know how it started, we do know what happens to Undead Cursed with the Dark Sign. For when the Undead dies, it is never truly dead but only one step closer to hollowing. Not all undead are hollows, but all hollows were once undead. You might be wondering, what are dark sigils? Well, I'm assuming that they're synonymous with the dark sign, and the description of the dark sigils says that they're a problem because Such a cool humanity shot. literally leaks out of them, and the gap that that creates is filled with the accumulation of the undead curse. So our character is always in the process of losing his dark soul, becoming more like the hollows that all humanoid beings appear to have stemmed from. And for ages, undead have been shepherded towards the first flame, to fuel it, to link it, to sit at it and reset the world and keep the gods in their age of fire. But the world was never meant to be stuck in this age of fire. It was supposed to go the Age of Ancients, the Age of Fire, and then the Age of Man. Natural progression. But this age, this Age of Fire, it struggles to die, much in the same way that the undead struggle to die. I mean, you even see the dark sign in the sky towards the end of the game. That's pretty symbolic. It is all a curse. <laughs> Feeble, cursed one! Your cursed flesh that will inherit the flame. <laughs> Undead are literally burned as fuel for the bonfires that perpetuate this age. And I had a realization, I finally understand that this is what we see in the opening cutscene. We see the soul of Cinder burning an undead to ash, assumedly to be buried in the untended graves, which, remember, are not far at all. From oh, wow. Then we arise from this undead ash as unkindled. Not just undead, unkindled. In Miyazaki's words, unkindled are undead who failed to link the fire and were burnt to ash. They exist to inherit the past and put an end to this cumulative tale. So the unkindled is special. We're not just cinder, we're not just the corpse of an undead, we're both. We're something new. A new species, for lack of a better word, that has a choice. The Undead Curse no longer has the power over us that it once had. We can choose to fuel the bonfires and burn like charcoal, or we could choose to embrace the Undead Curse itself. Let's go back to Dark Souls 2, where it actually foreshadows a lot of this happening. Vendrick, a past Lord of Light and a Lord of Mankind who lost himself to the curse, I think he knew that this was the way it would end, or at least he thought it would. With fire, they say, a true king can harness the curse. A lie, but I knew no better. Inherit fire and harness the dark. Such is the calling of a true leader. We are the... So cool, man. I love, I love Vendrick. First undead who harnesses the dark. 
we gain levels through the power of the Dark Sigil, and we even kill other powerful Hollows and claim their sigils for our own, so that we can be no, strong enough to claim my wife. Kind, and my wife. Our Lord and Liege, thine heart is fixed upon the linking of the fire. But brave usurper, I prithee, when the moment cometh to link the fire. A serpent. Pray the serpent. So that we hollows in most honest shape of man may have it for our own. You want to know what confused me most in Dark Souls 2? I probably avoided talking about it because it didn't make sense, and I couldn't make an episode on something that didn't really make much sense. So the Prepare to Cry episode for Nishandra is missing, because I could not figure out her motives at the time, but now I think I get it. So she was the Fragment of the Abyss that usurped the Age of Fire from her Lord of Light, Vendrick. And after this, Drangleic faded into dark. So you think, great, she won, she got exactly what she wanted, right? The world has plummeted into dark, so surely she'd want to keep it that way, right? Wrong, because she calls us her undead. She guides us, she tells us where to find Vendrick, she tells us where to find the giants. She guides this bearer of the curse all the way to the first flame, and we kill her. That doesn't seem very smart, but she says, Brave undead, you have proven yourself to me. Now, be one. And now I think I understand. I think Nishandra needs an undead. I think she needed to wed Vendrick to claim the first flame, but he ran away to the crypt where she couldn't follow him, so she needed a replacement, the bearer of the curse. I think that's why she led us here. If you proceed, Nishandra will come after you, knowing that you will take the throne and link the fire. She covets the first flame and the great soul. In a similar manner, I think, we wed Anri in this bizarre murder ritual and can subsequently claim the first flame like Nishandra wanted to. I always found it strange that a being of dark would want to claim the first flame. Reminder, this is just a theory, is what it says at the bottom. People linking it and let it die, but in Dark Souls 3 we learn that you can usurp it and we learn that those of Londor are making a real push for that to happen. So, Dark Souls 2 aside, in the Lord of Hollows ending of Dark Souls 3, we stifle the first flame within our bodies and collapse. When we rise, reborn, you see this beautiful little detail. You see the sun in the background. Yes. Red, like the dark sign, it's ringed with white. And there's this illusion where we lift this new sun into the sky, signaling and symbolizing a new age for mankind. So cool. This video is crazy long, but... The best is yet to come. There's two things I'm very excited about seeing in the next DLC, and I do think it's really likely that we'll get Londor DLC. So one is that there's this boss in Dark Souls 1 that was called Undead King Jaril, and oh. he was cut from the New Londo experience of Dark Souls 1, and I have a lot of fond memories of discovering Jaril from another Dark Souls YouTuber, Hellkite Drake. He's really good at digging in the game's files. So, since New Londo mirrors what Londo, the fuck? which I guess is New New Londo, uh, I'm pretty hyped to maybe fight Jaril in the DLC. Who knows? But the biggest curiosity, and you see a clue in the thumbnail, is Velka, the goddess of sin. Because I personally think it's undeniable that Velka is heavily involved in Londor. And Velka, the goddess of sin, is one of the most influential and Curiously, the most absent characters of the Soul series. That's true. So Elka, the goddess of sin, is a rogue deity, but she is versed in arts both new and old, and is considered to have a great range of influence even as gods are concerned. So, let me convince you of her involvement in Londor. So, her followers wear uniform black, just like the three founders of the Sable Church, and one of them in Dark Souls 1 was called Oswald, who was an inhuman swordsman, a fencer to be exact, just like the three daughters who founded the Sable Church. And in Dark Souls 1 and 2, these servants of Velka were called the Pardoners, men who listened to the confessions of sinners and 
The key words being, they offered salvation. The Sable Church, too, is also said to offer salvation. So I think if anyone is going to be the mother to the three daughters of the Sable Church, then I would put my money on Velka, 100%. Many spells 100%. In Dark Silence are the spells and rites of Velka in Dark Souls 1 and in Dark Souls 3, they're said to originate from Londor. In Dark Souls 1 also were the clutch rings that were said to reach out to the crestfallen and prevent despair. In previous games, they were said to belong to a dark deity. And here, now, in Dark Souls 3, those same rings are fabled in Londor to prevent the despair of men. Speaking of rings, we get the sacrifice rings from Yol's ashes, the hollow ashes, and the sacrifice rings also directly reference Velka. There you go. So I'm going with my list. Uh, Velka <laughs> also oversees the Dark Moon list of the guilty in Dark Souls 1, which was a covenant led by Dark Sun Gwendolyn. And in Dark Souls 3, this could explain why we sacrifice Anri within the Dark Moon tomb. She has a relationship with the Dark Moons as well. So it's crazy the amount of links there are here. The birds just One disappearing. More. There is a lonely statue of Velka in the Undead Settlement. True, we've seen this. The statue can dissolve hollowing. It can cure hollowing in the same way that a purging stone does. So Velka is irrefutably linked to the Dark Sign and the Sable Church of Londor. I think that's pretty undeniable. Okay, bud. Most curious is... You got me. is a rogue goddess the other gods feared. And, hell, I wouldn't be surprised if Velka is the one that holds the final few secrets of the Dark Souls series. Wouldn't it make sense if Velka was the one punishing the world for the first sin? Yeah, food for thought. Time will tell. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you all soon. Stuff that I definitely like about this is, uh, something that I definitely like about this is the, is the different and unique perspectives that are given. Uh, stuff that you don't even really think about at first glance, but he, the way that Varty is able to bring in all the different like sources from different games and then provide us with these connections is really cool. Uh, when he goes 100% on the Velka stuff and I was like, yeah, we'll see. And then he just like puts all the th pieces in front of you and goes, make of that what you will, you know? Uh, but very, very cool stuff to learn about Londo, I had no idea that there was like this cut boss Jaril from Dark Souls 1 and Varty hyping himself up to potentially fight like that boss in Dark Souls 3 lore that obviously we know never ended up existing. But that would have been really, really cool. Uh, Arnry is visible in the Lord of Hollows ending. I think I noticed that as well. That was pointed out um, in my ending episode. Velka could be the third eldest daughter, but I personally think it makes more sense for a goddess to be the mother, similar to the witch Visalith and her daughters. Interesting. Very cool insight into the hollows of Londor, and it's very interesting that he's sort of like very much gearing up for potential Londor DLC, only for us to get another painted world and the ringed city instead. Uh, but we're going to jump into the next video in the playlist now, which is the Angels of Lothric. There are two DLCs arriving for Dark Souls 3, and there are two very intriguing unfinished plot lines that still remain in the game. And these two plot lines, they directly oppose one another. One, in the previous video, was a tale of Londor, and this is a tale of the angels. That was a story of a dark wraith locked in the deepest depths, and this is a story of an angel locked in a cell in the tallest tower. A story about usurping the fire, and a story about linking it. A story of Karth and Frampt, of gods and men. Miyazaki, the game's creator, he takes a lot of inspiration from the manga series Berserk, and one of the most powerful themes in Berserk that I don't see a lot of people talking about is the displacement of good and evil in themes of light and dark. For example, good is seen in the Black Swordsman and his darkness, and evil is seen in the angels and their light. Similarly, in Souls, mankind were the ones with the Dark Souls, and even though the gods are associated with fire and light, these gods are dedicated to selfishly keeping themselves in power at the expense of all humanity. So 
keep this in mind as we talk about the angels of Dark Souls 3 because I wouldn't be surprised if Guinevere were a boss in the DLC. But we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that. And we're going to fight Guinevere now. Um, I blocked my eyes from that because I'm currently reading Berserk. So I was like, I don't want to see something that I'm not ready to see yet. I don't want to accidentally spoil myself in a Dark Souls lore video on Berserk. <laughs> And then Varty the Madman goes, we could fight Guinevere. How's that going to work? I mean, I'm sure I would know how that would work, but like, no. <laughs> to that. The angelic faith has its roots in Lothric, where Queen Guinevere is said to have raised several heavenly children. The Lothric bloodline has always been devoted to the linking of the fire, obsessed with creating a worthy heir. And their ruler, currently, appears to be the young Prince Lothric, and engraved upon the doors leading to his chambers are three figures that represent the three pillars of power that uphold his rule. First, like the knight, the maiden, and the scholar, right? It is to feed and care for the noble children. Essentially, she's their wet nurse. And it's clear that these women groom Emma. the princes for a role in the linking of the fire. They're not your traditional wet nurse, for one of them begs us to convince Lothric to follow his duty as a lord, and the other two sit directly within the Firelink shrines. The second pillar is the knight, responsible for the defense of the kingdom. The Lothric knights were allowed to tend to the wyverns and fight alongside them, as these dragons also belong as a symbol of Lothric. And the third pillar, the scholar, who is master of the grand archives of knowledge. And of the three, the scholars seem the most influential, especially to our young Lord Lothric, who was frail and disinclined to knighthood. The grand archives and the Lothric bloodline, they also rose together, and the first of the scholars was alleged to be a private mentor to the royal prince. And here is where the story gets really fascinating, because this private mentor, the first of the scholars, he doubted the linking of the fire, and it's clear that whoever he is, he planted thoughts of rebellion into the young lord's mind. So these were the three accepted pillars of the king's rule, the high priestess, the knight, and the scholar, but there was one more pillar who served Lothric on the fringes and in the shadows, the hunters, a fourth pillar of rule, who punish the king's enemies in ways that the king's three pillars cannot. These were highly adept warriors, and they were known for wielding paired weapons, and some were so proficient in their duty that they even managed to serve successive generations of kings. These hunters specifically became known as the king's black hand. And for generations, these okay. hunters served the Lothric bloodline, and for generations their rule was clearly prosperous. However, the pillars of Lothric are crumbling when we arrive, and Prince Lothric refuses to link the fire. So bear with me, once I have the groundwork laid, we can get into the really interesting angel stuff. So in Dark Souls 1, we were introduced to Guinevere, who was firstborn daughter of Gwyn, the man who linked the fire, and this illusion of Guinevere, at least, says this. Please, father's role thou should assume, and inheriteth the fire of our world. In Lothric, now, Guinevere is heavily implied to be the queen of Lothric, married to King Osiris, and revered as a goddess of fertility and bounty. And living up to that title, she became a wife and a mother who raised several angelic children. And just like in Dark Souls 1... She broke up with Flame God Flan. He wasn't cool fire. enough. One of those goddesses it needed a crazy dragon-obsessed king the instead. The children, they were obsessed with creating a worthy heir. And there's a lot more evidence of her influence in pushing undead and unkindled to link the fire. The path to the kiln itself is hidden behind the queen's castle, and unkindled are even born to the untended graves. Of the way of white, which is a symbol very closely associated with Guinevere. The queen even placed a powerful artifact in a coffin that she thought a future unkindled could profit from. And yet, the castle is in chaos, her husband has gone mad, and her noble children are scattered and defiant. So the queen does what she did in Dark Souls 1, 
she leaves the kingdom. And we, when we go through it, we're left to piece together how exactly this kingdom collapsed from the children, her children, that remain. Prince Lorien and his younger brother, Lothric, remain in the throne room of their castle, implying that they were the ones in power as their rule collapsed. Prince Lothric is described as the last hope of his line for linking the fire, but Lothric went against his duty and against Guinevere's legacy and refused to link the fire. When you approach their chambers, take notice of this stretch leading up to it. All the knights are facing outwards, barricades are raised, and sure, this could mean that they're protecting him from us, the unkindled, but I think that they could also be protecting Lothric from the angels and their winged knights. Okay. So this is my favorite part of the script. <laughs> At the tallest point of the Grand Archives hangs this enormous cage. Yeah, this, this was interesting. Pulse, white feathers and the miracle Divine Pillars of Light, which was a miracle of Gertrude, named the Heavenly Daughter, and in Japanese, the Angel's Daughter. Gertrude is said by many to be the Queen's child. This miracle brings down divine pillars of light, and it was told to Gertrude when she was visited by an angel. Despite losing her sight and her voice, you know, she was blind and mute, Gertrude was still determined to record this tale of the angel's visit. Somehow, this blind, mute girl wrote down what she heard in a fragmentary scrawl. And in Dark Souls 3, there's this huge tradition of placing great faith in the words of the blind. So somehow, despite being impossible for ordinary men to decipher, this tale of the angel became the foundation of the angelic faith of Lothric. This is so, so cool, man. Our question is, what does the angelic faith of Lothric stand for? What do they represent? And it's my belief that all angelic references are related to the Way of White, which was a human faith of clerics, paladins, and pilgrims who are supporters of the linking of the fire and the gods. Let me provide some evidence. As you traveled through... <laughs> <laughs> three, the sharp observer would have realized that there are a lot of angelic references. It's me, a statue. I'll name five and convince you of their relationship <laughs> to the kingdom of Lothric. So, one, the statues in Upper Lothric are winged, and one set of wings even belongs yeah, this to is a the mention of a primordial serp serpent statue. In the last episode, we talked about the mention of Karth, and on the flip side, wouldn't it be fitting for Frampt? who was this serpent in Dark Souls 1 who was a huge advocate for the linking of the fire, wouldn't it make sense for him to be a manipulating force in Lothric, a rule known for the linking of the fire? True. Secondly, in the Cathedral of the Deep you see statues of winged men, and indeed the archdeacons of the Deep wear robes denoting the highest rank in the Way of White. And originally, this order was not evil, they were devoted to tending to the flame. And in this video, we assumed that this meant that they were tending to the flame of Aldrich when he became a Lord of Cinder. However, when Aldrich rose from the dead, this order of the Way of White became corrupted by his influence, and they abandoned their service to the gods. You see this in the statue, the angels, this Way of White cleric, it's overcome by Aldrich's filth. Oh, okay. Third, the Silver Knight Helms are winged, and indeed, the Silver Knights in particular are loyal to the old royal family, even protecting this family's manor long after it was abandoned. In particular, though, the Silver Knight Shield has the blessing of their goddess Guinevere upon it, even to this day. And Guinevere is intrinsically related to the angels. Four of her children, Gertrude, Lothric, Lorien, and Rosaria, they have some link to white feathers. On Gertrude's cage floor, Lothric's floor, and shot from the bident of the Mangrub casters. And Gertrude's description the actually calls casters. her the angel's daughter in Japanese, not just a heavenly daughter. These children are linked to Guinevere, and they're linked to the angels. And finally, when I look at these beheaded statues in Lower Lothric, I think of another reference to beheading. Uh, you know, we place the heads of the Lords of Cinder, their cinders, 
atop their thrones to satiate the fire-linking ritual. I was looking at so much of the beheading are stuff. A symbol of self-sacrifice to the linking of the fire. Especially the one with the sword. They cut their own throats and yeah. hold their own heads this willingly one. in their hands. When these were built, Lothric was known for the linking of the fire, and I think these represent that. And the final reference to beheading to the Way of White are the winged executioners who swore themselves to the angels. And their set reveals the most curious part of this story. It says that worship of these divine messengers is heresy in Lothric and unrecognized by any of the three pillars of rule. In an attic in the castle, behind an illusory wall, lies a giant portrait of a winged messenger oh, and wow. a sacred shield, a shield known as Sorcerer's Bane and an heirloom of the Way of White. Now, cool. with all the connections we just made to the angels being supportive of the linking of the fire, the statues, the helmets, the feathers, why would Lothric call it heresy? Why build statues to something heretical? And the only solution I can come up with is that it became heresy when Lothric refused to link the fire. Yeah, he said true. that this is why Gertrude, the heavenly daughter, was imprisoned in the lofty cell of the Grand Archives. Her faith, previously accepted, must have become heresy when Prince Lothric took over, for he was positioned directly against it. And remember, the first of the scholars was private mentor to Prince Lothric, and of the three pillars, the scholars are closest to the prince. And it is the scholars themselves who tampered with the sacred chime of Gertrude, allowing her blessed item to be used for their own ends. And in a huge way, the scholars were behind Lothric's refusal to link the fire, and in turn, Lothric's persecution of the angels. It's no wonder that Guinevere fled the kingdom. And one of the earliest lore questions I ever had in Dark Souls 3, you might remember it, was why an executioner was patrolling a burning courtyard full of headless knights. Why this was the scene of a battle. And now I think I know why. Ooh, I think yeah, that's actually a, that's a cool observation. Of a conflict between the crown and the angels. Lothric knights and winged knights never fight together, and both Lower and Upper Lothric have corpses from each side within the castle itself. Additionally, the that's a really cool observation. The, Prince, the Black Hand, one of their rings, is on the roof where three fully ascended, golden winged knights guard the entrance to Gertrude's cell. The King's Black Hand assassin, loyal to Prince Lothric, was here, and he was killed. So now we come to the part where the answer is very much up to you. Is Gertrude, the corpse in the cell, perhaps killed by the king's black hand, or simply dead of starvation? Or is Gertrude's cell door open because she escaped, flown away by one of the winged knights? Or is Gertrude alive and in-game? Is she related to this man-grub, bizarrely placed on the rafters below her cell? <laughs> is Gertrude Rosaria? If I'm not mistaken, the first one to come up with this theory was Reddit user Deleted Away, who, in particular, reminded me of the Deacon's relationship to the Way of White, of Saint Klimt, and also of the Dark Wraith far below and the Angel up above. I am hugely thankful that he reminded me of these connections, because it's become a really important part of the story. So, why is this mangrub here? Is Gertrude Rosaria? The man grubs are Damn, creatures. Damn, that's that so interesting. Mother of rebirth. There's like the fact that like they can take like, uh, and it's cool that he's crediting other people for helping him push him in this direction as well. But it's just really cool how they can get to a scene where they're just like, oh yeah, by the way, there's like this man grub enemy off to the side here, which I didn't think twice about, and usually no one would. They just say, "Ah, oh, yep, there's and there's that guy there," because they need a long-range person on the rafters to knock you off and to annoy you. But the lore implications of that is very interesting, considering yes, they are linked to uh, Rosaria, and when you go into like the subjects of like rebirth and angels and all that kind of stuff, this is actually 
Um, such an interesting take on Dark Souls 3 lore that I didn't know that I needed. You know, like when people like dive into the lore, they're like, oh, I want to know about my favorite characters and uh, what's going on with this and the actual story of the game. And then you get videos like this, which it talks about and highlights one specific segment, draws in material from different games, like, and all of that kind of stuff, like to give a really entertaining and compelling uh, analysis on just particular parts of the of the story and the the world that are quite easily glossed over. Like the angelic knights wasn't something I ever really gave a secondary thought to while I was going through because like, you're focusing on everything else that's happening. So this is uh, really really cool stuff. Located in the cathedral of the deep and worshipped by some as a goddess, Rosari's fingers collect tongues in her name. Some do it to be reborn. Indeed, if you hand in more than five, you're said to run the risk of turning into a man-grub, but some simply give her tongues to help comfort their voiceless goddess. For Rosaria, mother of rebirth, was robbed of her tongue by her firstborn and has been waiting for their return ever since. We talked earlier about how the Archdeacons of the Deep are high-ranking within the Way of White, and We've established that the Way of White are devoted to the servitude of the gods and their Age of Fire, so it makes sense that the Cathedral of the Deep would have been a safe place for Gertrude to escape to, or at least why a daughter of Guinevere could reside in this place. Even if you don't believe that Gertrude is Rosaria, and I do have my doubts, it's incredibly likely that Rosaria is a daughter of Guinevere given the feathers and given the fact that she has one of Guinevere's miracles as a part of her soul. So you don't have to believe that Gertrude is Rosaria, but Rosaria is here for a reason. And as we know, the Deacons of the Deep became completely corrupted by Aldrich's influence. In fact, all three Archdeacons are characterized by an abandonment of their duty in the Way of White. One in particular, though, he was originally tasked with attending to Rosaria, Mother of Rebirth. His name was Saint Klimt, and we hear about him from his weapon, the Saint Spident, which he eventually discarded. This Bident was a holy symbol, which draws upon faith. You see this Bident, actually, when Mangrub casters attack you. This exact shape materializes, leaving behind a trail of white feathers. Oh, wow. Assumedly, this is a symbol of Klimt's relationship with Rosaria <laughs> through the Bident and Rosaria's connection to the Way of White through That's the That's crazy. Or, by now, if you believe this theory about her being Gertrude, maybe I should be calling Rosaria Gertrude. However, like the other deacons, abandoning their duty to the linking of the fire, Klimt discarded this weapon and put his faith behind him. So, if you believe the theory that Gertrude was Rosaria, then she was forced out of Lothric because the angelic faith was lost there, and after taking the name Rosaria in her new refuge, the Cathedral of the Deep, she was trapped there too, once the deacons became corrupted by the Deep. So, again, the Way of White and the Angels would have been cast out of Lothric, essentially, so there might still have been refuge in the Cathedral of the Deep, where the Deacons still served the Way of White, so that makes sense for Rosaria or Gertrude to be placed there. But after they turned to Aldrich, Rosaria would be in trouble. And you sort of see that when you look outside her chambers. There are mangrubs infesting the Cathedral, and they're defending her. They're staked to the walls, maybe in defense of their goddess, and there are bars that are bent outwards, and a lot of sludge around the areas. Mm. Maybe Aldrich tried to get in there when he was on his way out. So this entire part about Gertrude being Rosaria, it's a fantastic theory, and one of the best in the series because of all the little circumstantial pieces of evidence. Even it's very true. Even if I'm not totally convinced. And it isn't perfect. It doesn't explain the corpse in the cage, or why Rosaria, supposedly an angel, instructs her followers to invade and pillage. On the other hand, Gertrude taught her followers bountiful light. That's the most disgusting Rosaria's thing I've ever seen down there, by the way. Bountiful sunlight, a more powerful version of the same spell. We're just getting like Vanti's amazing like voice and insight into like the lore and stuff, and he's like, man, it's just cool how all these things can like be very coincidentally placed next to each other so you can like link all these things and speculation in Dark Souls is crazy and we're just doing this with a uh, dramatic zoom out of 
these grubs just vomiting maggots at us constantly. <laughs> but I truly do love this about the world of Dark Souls is it does seem like everything is very intentional. Uh, like nothing is a mistake. Uh, it gives you that feeling of just like down to specific animations, uh, effects, like when it's seeing like the, the Biden coming out of like this, this, their staff as like a, a spell, enemy placements, all that kind of stuff is just like the details surrounding all of that is you need a very keen eye for that. And it's very cool. If we get more information in the DLC, which I think we will, we'll come back to this topic. But for now, the only thing that matters is... What do you think? <laughs> it's been a while what do you since think? the way of white surfaced in such a powerful way. In Dark Souls 1, they sent an undead paladin to fetch the right of kindling. Deep Leroy Jenkins! The way of disposing of undead within their ranks. And they continued to send their undead to Lordran on this quest, convincing them it was a holy pilgrimage. You know, if they succeed, if they brought back the right of kindling, then great. But if they failed, then the Way of White just disposed of some undead. And in Dark Souls 3, the Way of White continues to use humans for kindling. And assuming the Way of White are the angels, they're presented as angelic, as good, as holy. But the reality is that them and Guinevere, likely at their head, are anything but. They've been using humanity for kindling. And I think we'll be getting the chance for a little bit of revenge soon. The day before I finished this script, user Ravenbiter underscore 114 made a thread on Reddit with evidence that Guinevere will be in the DLC, citing an unused boss track that sounds very much like <laughs> Guinevere's theme from Dark Souls 1. Have a listen. Guys, Guinevere's gonna be in the DLC. Trust me. Trust me, dude. I listened to some music and it sounded very familiar. I'd say they're onto something here, and <laughs> even if it's not Gwyneth, it could be someone related to her. So, with Gamescom coming up, I expect we'll be hearing about DLC soon. But what will it be? About the Hollows of Londor? The Angels of Lothric? Or will I be pleasantly surprised and it'll be something else entirely? Thanks for watching this video, and thank you to those who support me on Patreon. In the description, I'm going to leave <laughs> to tons of other theories, and some are quite different to mine on the nature of the angels in Dark Souls 3. So read up and come to your own conclusions. Thanks for watching, guys. See you next time. So cool. That was a very neat insight into Londor and the angels of Lothric. I really enjoyed those two those two videos side by side very cool like insight and being able to draw links and connect threads to things that would seemingly like normally just be completely glossed over as like that's a cool thing in this part of the thing not having a full like backstory and all this lore potentially surrounding it and i i i like and i've said this before i'm pretty sure that it's just like uh his ability to tell a story where there seemingly might not be one is very cool because a lot of this is can be like it's theories and it's speculation and it's drawing your own conclusions from like the lore and story does it in a way that's very impressive and some of the stuff is definitely has sources like it's definitely confirmed but the way that you can like link it to things and go eh, what do you think like this is just a theory um it's very convincing stuff it's very cool to think about it definitely gives a new perspective on um uh, on the world of, of Dark Souls. So guys, thank you so much for tuning in to this Dark Souls 3 lore reaction, watching uh, these two videos. Uh, we'll be getting into the next round of the Dark Souls 3 lore reactions shortly, because I think next up in the playlist are the first of the DLC related uh, videos. So I think that's going to be getting into the painted world of Ariandel, which is going to be very exciting. So uh, thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you in the next one.